Hello, Church One. It's great to be with you again this morning. Let me open us in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we do once again um, bow our heads and our hearts and ask that you give us the capacity to receive your word. And uh, we recognize that this week, like many others, has been a tumultuous week, um, lots to process, um, lots to think about, lots to feel. And uh, we ask that um, this gift you've given us, your word, would uh, make itself relevant in our lives. Uh, thank you for this old book that always has new truth for us. And we ask this all in your name, amen. Well, sometimes the best part about a book is the title. And uh, there was one particular book I purchased a few years ago, and it was really the title that got me. It was by a man named Ed Welch, and it was a little devotional, biblical devotional. But the name of it um, was Anger, a little book about a big problem. And that sort of hooked me in, and it really is a great little book about a big problem. But what got my attention was just this idea of a little book about a big problem. Because the reality is anger is one of those big problems that we sort of have a hard time recognizing. It's really interesting when we process a lot of what goes on, a lot of what happens in our lives or even globally or um, you know, anywhere in between. And we find ourselves asking questions like, why did this happen? Or why did this person do that? Or what, what was going on there? And we come up with our list of reasons, but at the bottom of often a lot of these reasons why these things are happening is actually this thing called anger. This anger inside of us, people are angry. And I, I, I know I sense it in our culture today. I'm sure you did, I've, I do. I, I've picked up that book a few years ago and I've, over the last couple years for sure, I found myself like needing what it was saying and reminding me and all that kind of stuff. And man, it's hard to like acknowledge anger or even get our heads around it. I've been listening to a podcast put out by Christianity Today um, the podcast is titled, Who Killed Mars Hill? And it's about a, a church and a church planning organization uh, in the last, in the, in the 2000s that sort of rose to prominence and sort of dropped off the map rather quickly. And the reason that it imploded, uh, there were several reasons in the podcast, it's like six episodes where they get into it. Um, and I'm about halfway through, but, but honestly, one of the things they say is one of the major reasons it imploded is because of anger undealt with, unhealthily managed anger imploded a church and a whole movement of churches, at least according to this podcast. I'll let you make your own decisions if you want to listen to it. But anger is all around us. It's part of the system. I remember talking to a friend of mine one time I was looking at their a family picture and their family looked so picturesque and, and happy and content and beautiful and all this kind of stuff. And I remember being in their house and saying, man, that's a, that's a great picture of you guys. And he said, oh my gosh, we had the hugest fight before that picture. And so I look at this picture and see this beautiful family. This person looks at this picture and remembers a family blow up and anger. That's what the picture makes him think about. Anger often flows through, if, if we think about it, kind of the networks of our workplaces, families, our teams, our classrooms, and very often those outside of those realities don't know of or even experience the anger. But those inside those realities, like my friend looking at his family picture, too keenly know of and experience the reality of anger. And yet at the same time, it's, it's really a, a difficult thing to deal with or even acknowledge. It, it is a, here's a good little exercise to just sort of think about your week. If I asked you right now, you know, when were you thankful this week? It might take you a little time to recall. But I wonder if I asked you the same question, like when were you angry? Or when did you experience anger this week? it tends to come to our minds much quicker. 
But yet at the same time, it's, it, it tends to be something we have a hard time talking about or addressing or any of that kind of stuff. And it can just, because of that kind of nature of anger, this kind of intense reality of it, but this challenge of dealing with it, it really has a capacity to rot our communities away. We talk a lot around here about making church a good place to be. And one of the practical realities is, is if we're gonna gather people together and work together and pursue the kingdom of God together and be a community of faith together, we have to acknowledge and deal with the reality of anger in, in our collective world as a church and in our, in our own individual relational worlds. And so I'm so grateful that we're gonna be spending time in the book of James, not just because we're gonna talk about anger, we're not gonna talk about anger for just five weeks, but because James is, has a vision for what God wants us to be, but he's also a realist. And he knows as a realist, for us to be a good place to be, we have to kind of deal with some of these issues that present themselves that if unaddressed, tend to rot communities out from the inside. This week, one of those issues is anger. And even though the passage is James 1, 17 to 27, just for sort of brevity and focus sake, I'm just gonna have us look at James 1, 19 to 21, a short little snippet where James instructs us on anger. So I'm gonna read it and I want us to just, I wanna point out two things that I think James wants us to kind of come to grips with, with anger. And the first is learning to slow it down, and the second is dealing with it. So James 1, verses 19 to 21, it says this, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. James is bringing up this issue of anger and he brings it up and I think he wants us to do two things with it that are really eminently practical if you think about it. The first is he wants us to slow it down. It's interesting he doesn't say don't get angry. He says be slow to get angry. That's really important and significant. One of the things that I think oftentimes uh, people misunderstand about the faith is that God is not opposed to all anger, nor does God see anger as implicitly wrong all the time. Anger is an important emotion. It can often point out what matters and what's significant and what's important. God himself is, at times, expresses an anger. I, I, I probably the number one objection I get from uh, non-believing people about the scriptures is they struggle with how angry God seems at times. But God's anger is always rooted in his righteous character and his anger is always extended towards that which is wrong and is destroying things. So anger is not always wrong. Jesus himself in Mark chapter, two, Mark chapter three and John chapter two, when he came to the earth, expressed anger in the temple when he saw the abuse that was going on. Paul, in the book of Ephesians that we just covered, said, be angry, but don't sin. I'm, I'm glad, and that's important, because anger is not always wrong, and, and we're not here to just act fake and stuff and suppress anger. But James is wise when he says, slow it down because there is this instinctual nature to anger. I'm not a neuroscientist by any measure, uh, but I've read enough books about the human brain that I have some confidence in saying most neuroscientists would tell you 
that you experience anger in your body through your brain stem and it takes a long time for the actual anger to make it to your prefrontal, prefrontal cortex up here where you actually have the capacity to deal effectively with your anger. In other words, anger zaps us first and it takes a while before we really have the capacity to process it and to deal with it. And so I think there's incredible wisdom. I don't think James uh, had MRIs back in his day and he knew of brain stems and prefrontal cortexes, but he knew enough about the experience of anger to say, you know, the one wise thing to do about anger is slow it down. Give it time. Give it time to process it. Don't just react to it. Don't just be instinctual about your anger. Be quick to listen, James says, but slow to speak and slow to get angry. If you just go on and you live off instinctual anger, you're gonna be miserable. You're gonna be miserable. Again, Ed Welch in his book, Anger, a little book about a big problem says this, in the short term, we feel like anger gives us the power and control we want but that's a mirage. In the end, you will be miserable if you are overpowered by your own anger. Instinctual anger doesn't work. Again, look back to Jesus. When Jesus was angry, Jesus was angry when other people's welfare was at stake. His anger was righteously directed towards the oppression of other people. When Jesus himself was personally offended, he was not under anger's control. In fact, in 1 Peter 2, verse 23, Peter, who walked with Jesus, said this, when Jesus was reviled, he reviled not, but kept entrusting himself to God, who judges rightly. Jesus understood the importance on a personal level to slow his anger down, and to entrust himself to God. And James is saying the same thing to us, slow it down. It's it's not necessarily wrong, It, it, it may be a sign of an important thing, but slow it down, slow it down. You know, there's so many like just good practical things about anger that I would do so well to observe myself. But the old adage of count to 10 before you say anything is again, just sort of what James is saying when he says, slow it down, slow it down. Anger's not necessarily wrong, but don't let it operate on an instinctual level. Let it be a thoughtful thing for you. Let it be something that you process. And that that leads to the second piece of wisdom that, that James has here. He says, process it, process it. He says very wisely, and, and if you remember nothing else from this passage, here's what I implore you to re- remember. James says, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God intends. Instinctual, unprocessed, human anger. If you're operating on the level of anger or if you're, you know, stuffing all your anger but, but, you know, passively, aggressively letting it out, however you choose to do it, but that kind of anger does not produce the righteousness that God intended. And so what you want in the end, what what tends to precipitate a lot of anger inside all of us is violations of ourselves or others. And we want the righteousness that God intends. We rightfully want that. And our anger can often be a sign that something is unrighteous. But James would say, unprocessed, hurried, instinctual human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God intends. Instead, James wisely says, kind of deal with it and process it. Again, he says in, in verse 21, let me, let me turn there again so I, I get it right, but he, he reminds us, he says, take away every evil desire and receive instead 
the word implanted in your soul. He says, get rid of all the filth and evil and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. One of the things that I think James would rightly say as we try to process our anger is you can monitor your inputs. You can, you hear that, America? We have the capacity to monitor our inputs. Things like media, social media, thoughts that we're allowing ourselves to just sort of germinate on, all of that kind of stuff. Un, you know, bad behavior that just tends to fuel up anger. James would say, you know, if you could actually get rid of those things, they're producing an unrighteous anger in you, and you actually do have the capacity to monitor those inputs. And it's, and it's you know, that's important to say, and, and, and probably now more than ever. I mean, I you know, I, I know it's important to stay informed. It's important to stay connected to people. And so I'm not advocating that you just unplug forever. But I really would genuinely ask you this question. The more media and social media you take in, are you significantly more angry when you're done? Because I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I question the intent of a lot of produced news media today. I don't know that the intent is strictly information. In fact, it probably isn't. The intent is ratings. And, and when that's your intent, anger is a wonderful thing to stoke because it gets people's attention. Again, hear me out. I'm not saying don't be informed. I'm just asking you, are you willing to monitor your inputs and think about what it's producing and wonder is it producing the righteousness that God intends? Paul says to instead, I mean, James says to, um, to, you know, receive, humbly receive the word planted in you. See, God wants to give you something else, something more real, more life-giving. It's implanted. It's not instinctual. The word of God is something you have to receive and implant, you know? There's a term, like it's real popular today, and, and I think it's a term that James is alluding to. A lot of people say, you have to process your anger. You have to process your sadness. You have to process your worry. And, and I think it's right, but, but I often think, well, what does that mean? I mean, am I the only one who's ever wondered? I hear people say, process your anger, and then I'm like, well, how do I do it? What do I do? And you know, it's interesting that the old ancient spiritual practice of confession really is a wonderful tool for processing your anger. Because I think confession, rightly done, is a way that the, you humbly receive the word of God implanted in your soul. And I think confession is a wonderful tool to do this very healthy thing today we like to call processing our anger. There's four steps that I kind of think are wise when it comes to confessing and particularly in, in dealing with our anger. And the first one is simply this, to name it, to just admit I'm angry. Again, I am personally amazed at how difficult it is for me to admit that I'm angry. Some of you, you know, like to be angry. I don't like to be angry. Um, I don't like to think of myself as angry. So I tend to instead be passive aggressive or to try to like, you know, hide it. And then I, I have a real hard time like admitting I'm angry. And, and it's really important to stop and to name it. Just name it, just start with that. That's what confession means to agree with. That's literally what the word means. And I think God would first have us name it. The second part of confession that I think is really good is to own it, to actually own it, to realize that you are responsible for the feeling. You are, I am, I'm angry 
I'm the one that is. And I'm responsible for this feeling. Because a typical, you know, there's the, yeah, but, yeah, but, I'm angry, but it's because, or if they would stop doing this, I wouldn't be, no. Like, yes, they're doing things and there's other reasons out there, but you're actually responsible for the feeling. That's what you're responsible for. So you can name it and you can actually own your responsibility. That's important. The, the, the third step in, um, in confession is to try to forgive and to ask for forgiveness. This is a tough one. I know it is. I was just meeting with a spiritual director this week. I was going over something that I was angry about and someone in particular I was angry with. And in the process, he had me name it, he had me own it, he had me pray about it. And then at some point in the prayer, he said, why don't you go ahead and just try to forgive this person in your prayers that you're angry with? And then why don't you ask God forgiveness for the unrighteous part of your anger, right? So you name it, you own it, you try to forgive, and you receive forgiveness. In a minute, we're going to go through this process. But one of the essential ways, and James, again, wisely says it, you receive forgiveness by implanting God's word of forgiveness into your heart. You don't simply receive it by feeling forgiven or by being, you know, all this stuff. Forgiveness is actually a pronouncement. If you went before the judge and, and a, a judge here and you had served a crime or you, you're guilty of a crime and you paid your penalty or the penalty was paid and then, the, then your penalty's due and the judge pronounces your forgiveness. In the same way, forgiveness isn't a feeling, it's a pronouncement from God. And so it's important to receive forgiveness, to ask for forgiveness, to hear God's word spoken. That's one of the reasons church is so great and scriptures are so great because it gives you this word of forgiveness and once that's done, right, once you've named it, once you've owned it, once you've tried to forgive and asked for forgiveness, and once the, the, the pronouncement of guilt is covered, this is important. Maintain a posture of curiosity because this is where I think you really deal with the anger. Once you've dealt with the guilt, you can, you can maintain this posture of curiosity. Why am I angry? What is it I'm actually angry about? Ed Welch, again in this book, he has such great wisdom. He says this, anger looks one way, but feels another. See, what looks like anger, I might, I might, you know, I might blow up at my kids, right? I, I blow up and to them, it looks like anger because that's what it is. But you know, inside of me, it actually feels different. It feels instead like I feel threatened or I feel um, misunderstood or I'm, I feel tired or I feel frustrated or all of that kind of stuff. And very often, once I've sort of named it, owned it, asked for forgiveness, you know, I, I, I can remain curious about it. What is it that I'm feeling? And that's actually, that's important. Because again, not all anger is wrong and anger often can be a tool to you about something deeper that's going on. And if you allow yourself to deal with it, you can. Now there's a whole nother step and I don't have time to get into it, but you know, sometimes a, a way to process your anger is to ask for forgiveness of those you've wounded. And I think that's an important part of it. But what I'm just talking about is this simple practice of confessing to God your anger. Uh, but please don't hear me eliminate the need sometimes to ask others for forgiveness because I think it's significant. So to be a good place um, requires vision, right? We keep talking about like, let's make church one a good place to be. It requires a vision for all of us to do that, you know, and, and to really lift up all that Jesus calls us to and all who we are. But you can't just have lo lofty talk about who you wanna be, that you also have to be realist realistic about the struggles you face. And that's where wisdom is so important. And that's where the book of James really matters. And James wants us to be wise and he wants us to, to, to deal with areas that keep us from being a good place. And one of those places, quite frankly, is anger. 
And so he asks us to slow down, slow it down, and to deal with that. And so let's do it right now. As, as we kind of bring this thing to a close, I'm just going to take you through those four steps that I kind of walked you through. And I just, just kind of give you, give you the gift of this spiritual practice we call confession. So just kind of bow your head with me and name it. Name it. Are you, have you been angry this week, this day, this month, this year? Name it. Now that you named it, I invite you to take responsibility for it, to own it. I'm angry. I'm the one that's angry. I take responsibility for my anger. I take responsibility for what my anger caused me to do. Can you name it? Can you own it? And now, can you forgive? It's a tough one. This is a tough one. It's a big one. I get it. But is there somebody, in, just, just in God's presence, okay? Just, just worry about you and God right now. Is there somebody you need to forgive? Can you forgive them right now before God? That's all I'm asking. And can you ask God for forgiveness? As you do that, I would invite you to receive his word. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says this, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Can you receive that word and that truth? And can that be a vessel of God's forgiveness? You are forgiven not because what you have done. You are forgiven because of what Jesus has done. The end of your anger doesn't come through your willpower. It comes through the blood of Jesus Christ who offers you forgiveness. And so as an agent as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not because of my judgment matters at all, but the word of God pronounces forgiveness upon you. May you receive that forgiveness that God's word proclaims to you. And now I ask you, be curious. Now that the guilt and the shame has been taken away, Give yourself the space to be curious about what your anger may be trying to tell you. What is it that God wants to say to you in this moment? I love the wisdom of James. I want us to be a good place to be, but in order to do that, anger <laughs> is one of those things we got to deal with. I pray God's grace and God's blessing on you as we seek to be people that are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God intends. God bless you. Have a good week.